did mom or dad, or mom and dad, uh, ever take a small vacation from you? Did you ever have a time when you were very worried about your parents? What were the circumstances of a moment like that? Were you ever in that situation? Of course, as my parents aged, I, I got a little worried about what mom was doing and where she was, but I didn't worry too much because I had a sister who worried 10 times as much as I did and talked to her nonstop just about every day. Uh, well, in fact, talked every day, but several times each day. Do you ever wonder where your parents were? What happened? Yes. Okay. So the night Alfred was born, the rest of the family, mom and dad left in the middle of the night, the kids were still asleep, and they woke up with a, church, a lady from church watching the rest of the family. What's happened? That had to be unsettling. And then they show up with Alfred. Wow, that, that, had to, that, that wasn't unsettling, though. He's a great guy. Was that in Guymon, Oklahoma, or someplace? In Tahlequah, Oklahoma. In Tahlequah. Yeah, those things can be tough to handle. Yes, Ron. Yes, Ronnie, that's the way it usually works, is uh, the parents were worried about Ronnie and his brother. Well, yeah, but it, it, every now and then, you worry about where your parents have gone. What's happened? Maybe something has kept them. Yes, Ron. Yeah, when you walked in at 11.30, your, your grown son says, where you been? Yeah, my daughter would do that to me when she was living in the house. If I didn't announce what I was doing, I had a parent bothering me that was 20 years younger than me. Yes. Oh, when they were supposed to come pick you up and they're late. I wish I could say my children never had that, that experience but uh, I remember on one occasion, uh, my daughter had walked halfway home by the time I, I found her and got her, carrying her saxophone that weighed about as much as she did. Um, and I heard all about that. We worry about those parents if they're not there, don't we? Did you ever do anything your parents told you not to do? What's the most, def I know you did, but what's the most defiant thing you did that you could laugh about now, but maybe your parents weren't? Your brother told on you riding a motor scooter with a boy. Yeah, that might have been my brother. He had uh, um, a Cushman Eagle, a Super Eagle, I think it was called, motor scooter. And he was very proud of that. But if a girl got on, on that, I'll bet there'd be some discussions. You ever do anything else that was a little bit like you shouldn't have done? Yes. Oh, Linda's good at this. Linda unwrapped her Christmas presents one year and then rewrapped them while Mom was at work and never said a word until years later. Oh, boy, I'll bet that's happening these days quite a lot. You know, children do disobey their parents, don't they? And sometimes they do so in pretty blatant ways. And now we're about to read about a whole nation that's worried about dad, that's worried about their leader, and he's been gone over a month. And so they start a little defiance of their own. We're, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 32, and we'll use this, this whole chapter this morning before we're done. But we'll read it in bits and spurts, and then you'll teach me about Exodus. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. Now... When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, Come, 
Make us a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then he took the gold from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a cast metal calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they got up early and offered bird offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to engage in lewd behavior. So how long has Moses been up on that mountain? You can go back a few chapters to chapter 24 and verse 18 to find out. But how long did Moses spend on the mountain the first time? Forty days and forty nights. He's been away for over a month, a month and ten days. How do you think the people felt being here in the middle of the desert? They don't know what's happened to their leader. You brought us out here, where'd you go? It's a long time for us to not have a leader. They're pretty concerned about that. Do you see anything political in this? Is there any attempted coup in this? Who is it that they go to? Aaron, what's Aaron's job? He's high priest, but he's also whose brother? Moses' brother. And what arrangement has God made what job did Aaron have before he became high priest? Moses' spokesperson. Moses spokesperson. And so here we have the press secretary, and everybody's coming to him, the fellow who's always been speaking for Moses, who considered himself not eloquent. And now they've gone to this spokesman. Is there any chance he's going to grab authority here? There's a big chance of that. Because remember, he and Miriam are going to challenge Moses directly later on. So here's a hint of that possibility of a power grab, of not wanting to stay obedient to his brother as well as the Lord. How does their, did their actions violate the Ten Commandments that they had heard from the voice of God and they'd all said and assented to them? And they had had blood sprinkled on the people. What? And they were told this was the blood of the covenant. So they've made an agreement with God instead of a signature down at the bottom. A covenant with God and often between individuals in ancient times was made with a sacrifice. Was made with blood. Blood was the signature. The seal of that of that covenant. God made one with Abraham and he made him, he had him cut animals in half and birds in half and put them in the altar and a torch went through there, remember? But that was the blood of the covenant between Abraham and, or Abram and God. And here they've had the blood of the covenant. Have they violated a part of that covenant? They were to have no other gods before me, but we're saying this is, this is our God right here. This is the same one. This is the same God. In fact, the image of the calf is going to be used, uh, the, the calf statue is going to be used in Israel for the southern, southern and northern kingdoms. And the idea behind the calf was similar to the arms of the mercy seat. God rides the calf. God's sitting on this calf. The calf is the throne of God here that we're worshiping. They would claim they're not worshiping a calf, although they are. So no other gods, but they're going to say, this is, this is our God. Is there another way in which they're violating the Ten Commandments? Pardon me? They've created an idol, and it is an engraved idol. And they were to make no graven image before me. 
they were specifically told not to make what they've just made. And so over 40 days, they seem to be willing to violate the first of the commandments that they've been given. Yeah, and then they've had their priest do it. We can understand their apprehension, but to get their priest to go along with this, if the priest is doing this, where, where are we going to go? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the internet at my fingertips, and I, I wish I had a, a mental one, but there is a, a time in which the, the prophet would say, like priests, like people, or like people, like priests, that... The priests were supposed to be leading the people, and they were often leading them in sin. And uh, if the priesthood is corrupt, what are the people going to be doing? It could be worse. Let's go on to verse 7. Exodus 32, verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you've brought up from the land of Egypt have behaved corruptly. They've quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a cast metal calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. So now leave me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you've brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians talk saying with evil motives he brought them out to kill them on the mountains and destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent of doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, And Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to you and to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented of the harm which he said he would do to his people. Tell me, what's God's opinion of this golden calf? It's not very positive. I'm sure it was pretty. It's gold. I mean, is he complaining about the artwork? No. No, no, it's not how pretty it was. It had no business being in existence whatsoever, right? Right. And this is making God extremely angry. It is possible to make God mad. You've hit on a very important thing, which I don't think I've got any questions about. He said, your people and your, your people have done this that you brought out of Egypt. And Moses says, whoa, they're yours, God. (laughs) Your people that you brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand, Lord. Why is God doing it? I wonder why God does that just that way. First of all, what did God plan to do? Wipe them out, and yet he's still going to be able to keep his promises because Moses will be the one who, it doesn't matter that you're 80 years old. Moses, you know, Abraham was older than you (laughs) when we started this thing. I'll make a big nation right out of you. Why does he relent from his anger? Moses quotes God himself. Moses uses God's promises against him. Moses uses logic and says, "This is what are people going to think when, if you do this? What are the enemies going to think? Now, why is God having this conversation with Moses? What's this for? Does God change his mind? Really? Not really. This conversation is all for the benefit of Moses. What does it do for Moses to have this conversation with God? I think it does some good. It shows him he is uh, committed to God and the determination to do whatever he 
it bolsters his, his commitment to God and his commitment to be the leader he needs to be. It bolsters his commitment to God's plan, absolutely. Back in, back in verse 10, I don't believe it relates to David. Or not. I don't think it's true, but it doesn't relate to Aaron and when, when the people did what they did, Aaron felt he had to please them, not stand for them. And so he decided, we'll go ahead and go along with this. Aaron never meant it with his wrong. Very good. Absolutely. Aaron clearly sees where the people are going, what the mood of the people is, and he's listening to the people instead of listening to God. He's given up being a leader, and he's going to be a leader who's a follower. He's listening to the polls. We need leaders who not only pay attention to us, but they first need to pay attention to what's right. And we, whatever our job is, you can't, you cannot compromise God's law in order to keep your job, in order to keep everybody happy. And here, Aaron doesn't lead, Aaron follows. That's absolutely right. How does Moses change because of this conversation? Does he change any because of this conversation? No. Well, that's absolutely right. It's very bold of him to be arguing with God and trying to change God's mind, and it seems that he does. And that's an example for us. Just because it seems like God's decision's been made, we, God still wants to hear from us. And we don't know what God may do. And God may be waiting for us to pray to do his will. And he might have everything going the other direction until we pray. Yes. Yes. The like, meekest like man. The things that have happened and what's going on now, he's like, listen, I'm leading these people. We're going to do it right. Yeah, this is a, uh, here they are back at Mount Horeb. They're right where Moses saw the burning bush. That's where he was, at Mount Sinai, at the foot. And now he's up on the mountain, and back just a, a few months before, Moses had been saying, send somebody else. Here's my well, excuse number one, two, three, four, and five excuses finally end with send somebody else, whoever you want. And now Moses has completely made, here he is taking on leadership and even arguing with God, don't kill all those people. He's changed completely. He's still the meekest man in all the earth. He's still... But he's now become the person who speaks with God like a friend. And now he's changed. This conversation may be, a, may be showing us how much he's changed, but what is Moses thinking through with this conversation? What's he arguing? You've made these promises. He's got to remember all these promises. And guess who wrote them all down? Who wrote in Genesis? Moses. And so Moses is the one who's able to recite this all to God, remind him of all this. He's come closer and closer and closer to the mind of God. And whenever God apparently has got too much of a temper, Moses says, wait. You've got to keep your promise. You've got to keep your promise. And he argues for the people. What would Moses have done, do you think, if he hadn't had this conversation and God just sent him down off the mountain? It's going to be bad enough when he gets down there. Yeah, I think he would have been, he was extremely upset, but I wonder if a lot more than four to 5,000 people would have died where he got down there. Let's keep reading. Then Moses turned 
and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the cry of victory, nor is the cry of defeat, but I hear the sound of singing. And it came about as Moses approached the camp that he saw the calf and the people dancing. And Moses' anger burned and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made and completely burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Then Moses said to Aaron, What have this people, or what did this people to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go up before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. So I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. And they gave it to me. I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. What well, was, I didn't know me. It just came out. Poof. What do you think Moses' frame of mind was as he came down from the mountain? He's not very happy. He knows God's frame of mind, God's perspective on this, and he is sharing God's indignation and his anger. How were his actions just a bit over the top here? He destroyed what God made? He, his were over the top, but maybe not as over the top as God's had been. <clears throat> I'll kill them all. Uh, he's not going to kill them all, but boy, is he angry. He is really, really upset. And uh, kill it, destroying the calf is a good thing. But turning it into soup, I'm not sure about that. How would you have reacted to your revelry being stopped suddenly and you're forced to have a serving of gold dust soup? How is that going to go down? You can just imagine. That, would, that must not have tasted particularly good. But it was all Aaron who did it. It wasn't us. <clears throat> I wonder how many of them could say, <clears throat> you know, the leader said this was okay. We were just following orders. Um, you know, I didn't go to Aaron. I'm not one of them. I, thought, I knew it was wrong from the beginning. I was just kind of going along. Or I didn't take part in all this. I just have stayed in my tent and was quiet. How many of them, you know, and how many people with... Uh, I thought, does that bother you about them getting their earrings out? Tearing their earrings out? Have you ever done that accidentally? My mother caught an earring on a car door, and it pulled through down her ear. And you know, the whole time my father was alive, dad wouldn't let my, daughter, my sisters pierced their ears. And while dad was alive, mother never pierced her ears. But after dad died and she'd been a widow for about a year, she got her ears pierced for the first time in her life. And whenever this happened, she had her ears sewed up. Guess what? She got it pierced again. <laughs> you went right back to it. But, you know, how do you argue I had nothing to do with this when you've got a, got a scar on your ear? You've got a torn spot that's healing up. Who did Ar whom did Aram blame? Is that the right English? Those is all the people. And by the way, I threw the gold in and it jumped out. 
Who would be responsible for that? The fire and... I mean, who's in control of all these circumstances? If a miracle took place, who did the miracle? God must have done this. This just, just happened. It's craziness. Now, when Moses saw the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to the point of being an object of ridicule among their enemies. Moses then stood at the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. And he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Every man of you put his sword on his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man, his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed. And about 3,000 of the people, men of the people, fell that day. Then Moses said, dedicate yourselves today to the Lord. For every man has been against his son and against his brother in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. Who killed whom? Who does the killing and who do they kill? The Levites go out and do this. By the way, who is the leader of their clan? Who is the oldest Levite around? Aaron and Moses. They're Levites. But the Levites abandon Aaron and come to Moses. They recognize what's going on has been wrong. And who do they kill? This is a civil war. They kill brother upon brother, neighbor upon neighbor, friend upon friend. They are not to have any pity. They are to recognize the judgment of God despite family and friendship connection. Oh, do we do that? We're just having a conversation about that. About what do we do when family is doing this and doing that? And with our society today, people are living in sin of all kinds. How do we handle those members of our families? Praise God, we're not in the Mosaic dispensation and we're not responsible to put a sword on our hip and go take care of sin. That's now Jesus' problem and he's going to, well, that's now Jesus' job and he's going to take care of all that in the last day. But wow. Verse 29, is that an odd statement for the scriptures to say in the midst of all this killing? Moses says, Consecrate yourself to the Lord that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. How is this slaughter a blessing? It's only 3,000, and there's probably a couple of million here. There's over 600,000 fighting men above the age of 20 in the book of Numbers. There's a whole lot of folks there, and only 3,000 die. Could have been worse, and... What's going to be the new attitude towards sin? Stay away from that. God does not mean God means it. We needed to mean it when we made that covenant with God. He's serious about this stuff. On the next day, Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people has committed a great sin. And they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will forgive their sins, very well. But if not, please wipe me out of your book, which you have written. However, the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will wipe him out of my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you, Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, on the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. Christ is called a prophet like Moses. Moses predicted it in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. And Peter preached that... The promise of God was that a prophet like Moses was to come, and he identifies Christ as the prophet like Moses. 
So if Christ is like Moses, let me ask you, how does Moses become a type of Christ when he bargains with God? We've got the clear identification of Scripture. A prophet is coming like me, and Moses, Jesus is that prophet like Moses. How does this incident help you see Moses and Jesus being so similar? How is Moses like Jesus on this occasion? He's a mediator between the sinners and God. He's willing to give himself up for the people. Does he understand what it means to be blotted out of God's book? It's not just having your life lost, is it? But that shows how much of a leader he is. That's the kind of leader he has become. Absolutely. He starts out being an anti-leader, a non-leader. I don't want to do it. Please don't make me do this. I don't even know your name. They're not going to believe me. Send somebody else. And now he has blot me out. Paul will say the same thing in Romans, essentially, whenever he says, I would become accursed for them. For the Jewish people is who he's speaking about in that instance. God told Moses, no, whoever sinned, I'll blot him out of my book. What did he tell his son? blot you out of my book on the cross. I'm stretching. I know that. But whenever Moses said, blot me out, God said no. When his son said, let this cup pass, nevertheless your will, God said, follow my will. And God let him take on our sins. What options did God leave for himself? How was that merciful and just? God doesn't kill them right now, but what does he have to say? They will be punished. punished. What's that? They won't go. go, Now that's going to come in response to another sin, but God knows about that in advance, right? God's able to make that plan. All of these people 20 years of age and up aren't making it. It's not going to be very long until they send out the spies. The intention was, or at least the original plan seems to have been, although God knows the end from the beginning, and he knew about the 40 years of wilderness wandering, but they're, they're told to go into the land, and they're supposed to be going straight in. They're supposed to head straight there. And they disobey God in a lack of faith, and they are punished. And God knows that's going to happen. But what else happens in response to this debauchery. Yes? Only the guilty will be punished. And it seems like it can't be that way. It looks like the righteous, you know, if you went around killing everybody, and the Levites went around killing everybody, that they'd be killing a lot of innocent people. Well, God's in control. It would seem like the Babylonians coming in, sweeping into um, the city of Jerusalem, and killing indiscriminately, right, left, and sideways. We're going to kill all the wicked. No. The prophet said they'd been marked. God didn't kill the wicked with the righteous then. That's right. That's, that's right. They had to go do burnt offerings and, and go through the whole... Old Testament law in order to get their forgiveness and Jesus is already our offering. His blood already is forgiving us from our sins but remember what have they done to sacrifice? They've made their bird offerings and peace offerings to this golden calf and then they're in the middle of dancing. You know there's good dancing and bad dancing. There's good dancing and there's bad dancing. Miriam and the women after the after the uh, the Egyptians are swallowed up by the Dead Sea by the uh, Red Sea, they're dancing. That's good dancing. There's good singing. There's good music. I hope we'll have some good. I know we'll have some good music in a minute. We're going to do some great singing. 
but this was not good dancing. There's some dancing Christians don't have any business doing, and there's some singing we don't have any business doing. I like those songs, though. I don't know why drinking songs appeal to me, but I always like their tune, and I have to stop listening to country because, you know, I, I like the uh, Jose Cuervo song or tequila. I, it, it just, it's not right. And there's bad singing, too. I don't need to do that. Yes. Rivalry. Rivalry. Which verse are you talking about? Revelry. 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 Dancing is just a, a part of this. And in fact, didn't our New American Standard Version we're using here, didn't it call it debauchery? There is a clear indication fornication is going on as a part of their worship. And that's no big surprise. Um, what's good about the mad about them being led by an angel through the wilderness? What's handy about having an angel with you? He knows the way. Whenever you're thirsty, he's good, the, the, the angel's with you, and the rock is with you, and Paul will identify the rock as Christ, right? It followed them through the wilderness. You got God with you. What's bad about that? When you decide to have a big dance, <laughs> he's right there. Punishment can come very swiftly as well. I want you to think about a couple of things. How do you feel about people who give you second chances? We ought to be thankful to them. We ought to appreciate them, do we? I hope we usually do. We should appreciate them. Does the devil ever make us resent them? He shouldn't. But it's a funny thing about human nature. Even though you've not done anything to remind somebody about how they've wronged you, quite often the sin comes between you. And if forgiveness comes, sometimes people don't want to see you because it reminds them of their sin. It's a strange thing. We've got to be grateful when we're given that second chance. And we've got to make sure when we give a second chance that it's a full second chance. How does God want you to feel about your forgiveness? He wants you to feel so like that as you forgive Christ, how much Christ forgave you. He wants you to forgive others as you've been forgiven. Exactly. In fact, he predicates your forgiveness on whether or not you forgive others, right? He says you've got to forgive others. That's the one part of the sample prayer that the Master gave us in the Sermon on the Mount that he explained. I wonder what I wonder if God doesn't want us to treasure our forgiveness and have some understanding. Why does the Bible go around describing hell for us? We need to understand how precious it is. How would you have responded to Moses' call? Come on over. Would you jump up and say, whatever the job is, I'll go do it. You're right. This is wrong. This should not have been going on. Or are you going to be afraid, I'm going to offend my neighbor? Or, boy, I have a full tummy from this wonderful feast we've been having. How would we respond? What do you think about Aaron's behavior? It is surprising. It should be surprising. Moses is not a perfect man himself, is he? Guess who's going to make the next set of tablets? Guess who's going to engrave the next set of tablets? Moses is going to have to make them himself this time. He's going to have to get busy. I'll bet that was a beautiful set of engravings, maybe. Or maybe they were rough and natural. I don't know. I, something made by the hand of God, I could imagine, that would be beautiful beyond any gravestones we've ever had, we've ever seen. And God made them. And then Moses throws them and breaks them. But what do you think about Aaron's behavior? I'm surprised about it. Are you a little disgusted with him? I am surprised also that God didn't take him out. That, wouldn't, that, would, that would fit my version of the story a whole lot better. His sons are going to get fried. 
in Leviticus just because they offered strange fire before the Lord. Here's the man making a golden calf and having a big celebration, a debauchery that he does not restrain the people from. Have you ever been tempted to make some irrational excuses? Why do we sin? Do we just want to quote Romans 3.23 and say, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Everybody does it. Do we ever want to, you know, go and quote 1 John, the first chapter, and say, If we say we have not sinned, we say we do not sin? We make ourselves a liar, we make God a liar. You know, verses 8 and 10 there are not excuses for sin. The fact that everybody's sinning doesn't make it okay. God is still going to punish unforgiven sin. And we need to take sin seriously. And not come up with an excuse saying, I threw the gold in and out it came. Poof. Because we're lying to ourselves and to God. I wonder if he believed this. I can't imagine he did. But people will make the craziest excuses. I will solicit your quest, your uh, interest in what you'd like to study next quarter. I'm going to stay in here. Um, next week, we'll be in here. Tell me what book of the Bible you'd be most interested in studying this next quarter. I'll teach it for you. and then. Uh, but the auditorium class will have John um, Roberts, Robertson uh, teaching class in a more small discussion setting. So look forward to next quarter. But next week, I'll be in here starting our new discussion uh, because it will be the holiday dinner and there is a special guest coming. And uh, we want to be sure we've got everything ready for him. Okay. We'll see you next week.